Okay, well, welcome back to uh, the Rare Classic Cars with Bob and Adam. Bob, let's talk about, you know, you getting into General Motors and then some of your time at Opel because as I look back and I reflect on what really were some of the halcyon days, I would say, of Opel, yeah, it, it, it reads like a Bob Lutz playbook almost, yeah. kind of taking this, I don't know, tiredish brand and rejuvenating it with an extreme focus on product and design, almost like the, the, one of the first playbooks that you deployed. Well, it, it, you're right, because uh, when I got to Opel, they were building basically boring cars for boring people, and it was driving the Americans at Opel, it was basically driving them nuts because they wanted to move ahead, especially the design guys. And they had a lot of proposals in design, like the Opel GT, that the Opel sales department had nixed. Um, in fact, we, we had some proposals for uh, a sports car off of the Opel Cadet. You, you may remember the Opel Cadet rally, sure, yeah. US version. Well, the European version, the initial one was was really hot in an 1100cc engine and sports wheels and it was lowered and it was it was a hot little car. Uh, and it, it felt faster. It felt faster than it was, which was part of the appeal. And we asked the sales department for an estimate, and they said, "Well, we have to consult our volume specialist." So they got her professor, Doctor Weigel, who was a statistician, and he poured over his books, and he finally came up with a volume assessment of minus seven thousand. I said. How how do we sell less with this thing than without it? And he says, well, that's very easy. This car is so out of keeping with the Opal image and so vulgar that the average Opal customer and his wife coming into the showroom will see it and they say, oh, what's that vulgar thing over in the corner? <laughs> Come on, dear. We're not buying here. Let's go somewhere. So that was a net negative uh, yeah, to the portfolio. Yeah, a net negative seven thousand. I said, you know what, Doctor Reichel, I'm just not going to listen to you. <laughs> and I I talked the managing director and my direct bosses into it, and we launched the car. We had it was front page news uh, in Bild Zeitung. Um, it was huge. I mean, great big. Opel launches sports car for under 10,000 marks. And we had like more than a year's worth of production build orders the first day. It's amazing. I mean, you look at the portfolio, everything from the GT in, I think, 1968. That was another tough one. And, the, and you have the, the um, Ascona, the Manta, yeah. the Record D, you know, the, the Chuck Jordan cars yeah, too. Yeah, beautiful cars. How did, how did that design evolution come about? How did... All right, we, we, I've been discussing this one a lot lately with former GM designers, but Chuck Jordan was a great designer, but very American in his orientation. You know, he very much liked DLOs that were like this and half vinyl roofs capped at the end, and vinyl roofs that didn't come over the edge but had a little chrome bead before the drip uh. rail. And he, he, he just loved that stuff. And he came to Opel and he says, here's what's wrong with you guys. You need a little pizzazz. And he started taking the cars and I said, Chuck, listen, uh, let me try to help you understand European design. And he had been indoctrinated by Bill Mitchell who said, there is no such thing as European design and American design. There is good design and bad design, period. And American design, as practiced by General Motors, is good. And what the Europeans are doing is pure crap. And I suppose, seen through American eyes, he was right. But the Europeans weren't seeing it through American eyes. They sure. were seeing it through European eyes and a, a more subdued, cleaner, less ornamented, tighter uh, execution 
spoke functionality and engineering excellence and sent all kinds of sublim subliminal uh, messages to the European customer that frankly, you know, the average American designer didn't understand. So I wrote Chuck Jordan a long treatise, which I did all by hand. And I, include, pic, I included pictures of a De Tommaso Mangusta and an Isophidia and et cetera, all, all of the good Giorgio Giugiaro stuff. And then I did a lot of sketches of American roof line, you know, exaggerated flowing sea pillars <laughs> and, and then European roof line, very, very crisp and American DLO, very tight, high belt line, thick roof, then European belt line tend to skive down from the front door mirror and, and then a very thin roof with a slight arc to the top and a very thin roof. I, I sent it to him and I didn't hear anything for about four days. And then he called me over to design. He said, close the door and I did and he said, let me tell you something. I got your 10 page thing and I read it and I internalized it. And I'm telling you, don't you ever try to teach me about design again. Is that understood? Because you're a marketing guy <laughs> and I'm a professional designer and you don't know anything about my business. Is that clear? I said, yes, Chuck, it's clear. He says, having said that, you make a lot of excellent points in there. <laughs> and, so he acquiesced a little bit then. Yeah, yeah. And then he said, I, I get it as far as that Italian design is concerned. I'm going to go down. I've already made the contact. I'm going to go down and see Giugiaro. I'm going to meet him. I'm going to see what he's doing. And the, the two of them became fast friends. And, um, and then Chuck Jordan told me, he says, the next record Commodore I'm going to do, it's I'm going to out Giugiaro, Giugiaro. So. Well, they came out gorgeous, not just on the outside, but even the inside. Everything. That car was near perfect. That black IP that kind of wraps into the yeah, doors, no, too. It was, it was fantastic. It was a fantastic execution. And the one that all the GM designers, retired designers, remember, and I remember, which we, we were never able to sell because of the additional investment was the Commodore, which had the six cylinder engine, which which fit under the hood. But design and I wanted about five inches more hood length. And that Commodore coupe with the additional five inches hood was to die for. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was fantastic. It took it into another class. And we kept throwing it to top management and to the finance guys. And they said, yeah, it's nice, but so what, you know. Easy, Bob, the finance guys, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you got I, the Commodore A through, right? Was, eventually, yeah. Well, that was the Commodore A, but it was the B that, that had the nice body. Yes. And that yeah. was the one where we were going to, we wanted to extend I see. the front end also to pull it away from the record because other than grill and trim, they were really identical. And uh, we never sold that, which was a shame, but it, you know, the Commodore did all right. And Opel went from being the sloths of the Autobahn that the guys in Mercedes-Benz's and BMW's kept having to figuratively sweep out of the <laughs> left lane, uh, suddenly became dominant. And if you had a Commodore GSE, with uh, the 150 horsepower fuel injected six, that was faster than, well, maybe a BMW, the the, the six series and the the the, uh, the big ones, the six the six cylinders, three liter, yeah, three liter fuelies that had, I think, a 200 horsepower. They were slightly faster, but other than that, you were faster on the Autobahn than any BMW or Mercedes Benz around. So it, it made Opals respectable. Did you have anything to do with that Diplomat uh, 327 coupe at all? No, that was after my time. That was, 
well, the the big coupe, the first one. The one done by Carmen, yeah, that was built by Carmen. Yeah, no, that was done outside my jurisdiction and before my arrival. Got it, got it. Well, yeah, it was a shame because it was a nice car, but it never sold. It's a beautiful car. I think they sold 340 or 350 yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and most of those had to be bought by dealers <laughs> out of a sense of loyalty to the make. <laughs> Well, great. Well, maybe we'll just transition to, to BMW then. And I think you left in 1971 for yeah. BMW. And I mean, it seems like from what I've read, a, a large multiple of what your GM oh, yeah. salary well, was. One of the, one of the problems with, with my tenure at GM is I was promoted so fast uh, up to um, head of global sales and marketing at Opel, which at the time was the second largest car producing entity within General Motors. So I had, after Chevrolet, I had the second largest sales job in the corporation. And I wasn't even, I don't think I was, I wasn't even 30 years old. And I'd been with the company for nine years and my salary, get this, was 27,000 bucks a year. And they, they, they kept giving me promotional increases but I never got the merit increases. So uh, so you were bottom of the band, kind I, of. Well, uh, everybody else, all the other guys at my level at Opel, you know, the chief engineer, head of manufacturing, the chief financial officer, with bonus, they were all making like close to 200000 a year, which back in those days was awesome money. Sure. Uh, and I was at 27000 so <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? And... I, I would talk to whenever um, the senior management came, like Pete Estes, who was president of the company at the time, would come and he'd say, Bob, listen, we, we appreciate what you're doing. You're a phenomenal asset to this company. You're going to go far. If it weren't for the fact that we've got a presidentially mandated salary freeze right now, we, ah, would, be, that's right. we would take care of you big time. We know you're underpaid, but Jesus, do me a favor, hang in there. You're going to be taken care of. And I said, well, Pete, you know, I, I love the company. I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm having a great time. I believe you when you say I've got a, a, a good future and so forth. But God, I mean, I have to look after. I, he said, I know, I know. Just watch. We'll take care of it. Well, meanwhile, BMW came along and offered me the then equivalent of 200,000 salary plus bonus, <laughs> plus starting bonus, plus chauffeur, plus all these company cars. Oh, you want a company bike? Oh, and have we told you about our entertainment allowance? We don't expect you to spend your own money entertaining people. We want you to use caterers for that because wow. we want everything to be BMW like. Don't worry about the expense reports. Just submit them. They'll never be questioned. And, wow. And so all of a sudden I was like, wow. Besides, BMW was at the time, they were only doing 200,000 cars, 180,000 cars and 20,000 bikes a year. But demand-wise, there was basically demand for 10 BMWs for every one they could build. And uh, it was a company that could do no wrong. Uh, it was developing a, a fantastic reputation as the ultimate driving machine, uh, the German prestige make for people who felt that Mercedes-Benz was their dad's car uh, and so forth. So it was... Uh, Did you in, Were you involved in insourcing the design from Bertoni at all? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh sure. Well, I wasn't involved in insourcing. They insourced it with no design department. Oh, okay. So the chief body engineer, Herr Hofmeister, was also the chief designer. That sounds perfect. It saves money, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you, you eliminate steps. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's built and, and manufactured. When, when I got there, you know, I had my initial meetings with my sales and marketing guys. And they said, Mr. Lutz, you've got to get yourself a look at the upcoming new 3 Series, or 2002 as it was then. Sure. I said, why? They said, sir, it's a disaster. We can't let this proceed. I said, well, has anybody mentioned this? 
Yes, but Mr. Hofmeister isn't listening because he says it's finished. <laughs> so I went, I scheduled myself to go see him. And he had this, this perfect new 2002 in a tiny little room. I mean, it was like, it was almost like a cubicle. You could, you could barely move around the car. And it was done in, uh, in wood, then coated with plaster of Paris, sanded, sealed, painted, and it had real glass in it. Wow. All the chrome moldings had been meticulously done and glued on. So no clay modeling then? No, that, it's not accurate enough. It was, wasn't accurate enough. And I looked at it and the thing looked like a box. I said, Herr Hofmeister, this is not going to do it. He says, well, what do you suggest? I, su I suggest a melt and repour. <laughs> and he said, well, we can't do that. You see, it's finished. I said, you've been working on the wrong, you finished the wrong thing, Herr Hofmeister. And he said, well, but we're about ready to commit the body tooling. I said, please don't. And that's when I talked to von Kuhnheim and I said, look, we need a design department. And he basically said, well, what does that comprise? I said, oh, we had a chief designer. Um, we had the, the French guy. I'll think of his name in a minute. Is this the gentleman who did the turbo coupe? Yeah, exactly. I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, I'll think of his name in a minute. But a great designer had nothing to do because Hofmeister said, I'll call you when I need you. So um, I, at least I let him do the turbo coupe, which he was able to demonstrate what he, what he was capable of. And then uh, I, I talked to von Kuhnheim and I said, we, we're no longer using... The, the Italians, so we need a design department. He said, what does that entail? I said, well, it entails basically a small building. It, we've got to get some, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the metal plates, there's a technical term which I can't remember right now. Armature or something? No, I don't think of it. But at any rate, uh, Paul Brock was the designer, by the way. Um, and uh, we'll need some designers and clay modelers. And he said, well, where do we get all that? I said, let me, let me contact um, Dave Holtz, who was now the new chief designer at Opal. And I called him up and, I, and he said, what can I do for you? I said, Dave, we got to set up a, a design department at BMW. He said, "Well, don't you have one?" No, we got nothing. I mean, we've got we've got no platforms, no building, no clay modelers, no clay, no armatures. He says, "Well, I can help." Oh wow! So, so, so GM helps set up a BMW. BMW design. General Motors in 1972 set up free of charge the whole. BMW design mm. department. Oh my goodness. And Dave Holes being the person who did for the viewers the second generation Riviera, the 70 to 72 yeah. Monte Carlo. I mean, a lot of seminal designs yeah. in the GM portfolio too. Yeah. Well, he sent clay modelers down to sh show us how to do it. They helped us hire clay modelers. They showed us how to build the armatures. And then it came time to order <clears throat> several tons of clay. And we contacted the German clay manufacturers and they said, sorry, all of the future shipments have been called for by Ford and Opel. I called Dave Holtz again. He said, not a problem. Those are just standing orders to make sure we're never short. <laughs> but we can divert a couple of tons down your way. <laughs> so we even got our first clay shipments from General Motors. Wow. And that's when we started doing the first, the, the first one uh, off was the new 3 Series. And um, that was one where um, aesthetics took precedence over function in many ways in that, you know, engineering and marketing wanted the sides stiff for interior package. 
but it made it look boxy and it increased the frontal area and the top speed would have actually been below the old 1600 ah. and 2002 and that just wasn't acceptable so I had them roll the sides in and then it had a very ugly front end and I asked him to do the front end off of the turbo coupe which with the the nose slightly extended with the with the two little kidney grills in it uh, by the way in my judgment BMW has gone a little bit too far on that theme <laughs> right now but, but it, it, it really worked I mean when people were blown away when they saw the three series and one of my guys in marketing we, we had this endless argument about nomenclature because we had the 1600 and the 2002 but then we also had a BMW 2000 sure which was larger than the 2002 and as we started putting various engines in various bodies using the designation of the engine became more and more impractical and my domestic sales manager who wasn't a very imaginative or creative guy he was just a mid-60s near retirement solid plotting guy who was good with the dealers said it's really not my purview Mr. Lutz but he had a little slip of paper with him but I just had a little been thinking and I thought you know maybe maybe the system we could use would be and he had the whole three five three five seven series and six series for the coupes he had it all laid out with you know 316 318 sure. 320 the 325 series name and then the engine yeah, size the second, yeah the second two letters would designate engine size it was perfect so that that solved that problem but uh, i found as i stated in my books bmw at the time was a totally corrupt organization i mean everybody was on the take and you uh, stayed three years, I think. Yeah, and I, I just got tired of it. When Ford wanted me, I was ready to leave because I just could not stand that environment of, well, people would offer you bribes and, the, and I'd say, I'm sorry, I, I don't do that. I wasn't raised that way. Oh, come on. Everybody does it. If you don't take it, I'll go to somebody else. Amazing. So then I, you. I fired whole departments. Whole department. The, I fired the whole distribution department in 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 sales. Wow! Because they were involved in busting up the Max Hoffman. Uh, oh, they, 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 they were all involved with with Maxi Hoffman in the U.S. They had the distribution department had schemes with foreign distributors, where the foreign distributor would say, "Get me, get me ten more three series," or. 2002s at the time and three of them I'll sell them to you at my I cost see. and then these guys would sell them on the domestic market and we noticed it because uh, these export VIN numbers started showing up in domestic warranty uh, domestic warranty statistics that we couldn't figure it out and we'd go ask the owner where did you buy this car say I bought it from so and so directly at, he works at BMW. I see. And so we found out that the distribution clerks were siphoning cars off that they had obtained. And you know what? The, the sense of morality, I don't know whether World War II brought this on, where uh, you know families had to scramble for survival. And, but invariably, when I confronted these people, I said, you're fired. They said, what for? What did I do? I said, you... you, you unlawfully sold company property for a profit. No, I didn't. The distributor sold it to me and I resold it. What's wrong with that? <laughs> wow. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating story. So, I mean, summarizing BMW, it, it seems like everything from the first three series to the six series to the kidney shape grill you know, and the even keeping the black ring with the BMW around it is oh, that was a fight. really a truly a truly attributable, if you will, to that was you. totally mine. If uh, von Kuhnheim got one of these, and these guys are the the bane of the industry, consultants who want to modernize the company, 
by refreshing your logo. And you know, I think good companies like Ford Motor Company, they've got the oval, it's perfect. These consultants come in and say, this thing is so old, we'll, we'll, we'll make you a new one. They just say, get out of here. This thing is worth more than, more than diamonds. Mercedes would never tamper with sure. the star. Volkswagen would never tamper with the VW emblem. And I didn't think BMW would tamper with the, the, the white blue rondel with the black ring around it. Sure enough, I go into von Kuhnheim's offices. Well, I have about made the decision we're going with these US consultants who have convinced me we need a new logo. <laughs> and I looked at it, it was terrible. And I, I said, Mr. von Kuhnheim, I haven't been here very long, but I plead with you, do not do this. You're throwing away a major portion of the heritage and value of the company. And, you know, he finally acquiesced, but the consultants had already 90% talked him into it. Wow. That's amazing. So tumultuous, you know, relationship there, it seems. It's yeah, sometimes von, it... von Kuhnheim and I had a very tumultuous relationship. And um, I, would, I, I would say he could um, justifiably accuse me of insubordination. Uh, and he could justify, and I could justifiably accuse him of intellectual dishonesty. <laughs> and, uh, but I did, as, as I say in Icons and Idiots, he was a successful CEO. I did learn a lot from him. And um, at the end of my tenure at BMW, I won't say we became fast friends, but we became good acquaintances. And whenever he was in London and I was chairman of Ford of Europe, uh, we'd have dinner together at some nice London hotel. And he'd, and it, invariably he'd say, you know, Mr. Lutz, we didn't always get along, but when I look back at it, I credit you with having saved BMW in wow. that period. Well, yeah, and then, you know, maybe we'll take another brief pause. Of course, we were both immature. <laughs> I mean, like he was, he wasn't even 40 or he was maybe 40. That's right. Or, That's right. So we were both kids, basically. Wow. And then we'll take a quick break here, but I think then you transitioned from that and into the loving arms of Phil Caldwell and subsequently yeah. read polling, right? Uh, yeah. Which is exactly what you were looking for. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> so maybe we'll pause for one second and then come back with Bob. Hope you enjoyed part two in this multi-part series interview with Bob Lutz. Stay tuned for part three where Bob details his experience at Ford. Until then, Check out these video thumbnails at the bottom left and right for some videos for you. Thanks again and take care.